In this industry, where half the AAA games are open world grindathons, where you spend half your time in menus arranging colour coded equipment like you're trying to reassemble a disturbed Trivial Pursuit board, and half the indie games are pixel art light work simulators where you manage a potion shop while romancing a shy anime girl with a nose ring and devil horns, any developer that can manage to give its games a truly idiosyncratic style is to be celebrated. And that's why I've always appreciated Remedy Entertainment, and especially their 2010 game Alan Wake, which set in stone everything we could come to expect from Remedy's output from then on. Games with a supernatural theme pushed through a filter of weird contemporary mundanity, a not quite seamless combination of cutting edge graphics and live action video, and a focus on in depth writing to make up for the story being completely up itself and the combat being kinda shit. And Alan Wake 2 continues the pattern with aplomb. I mean, any work of fiction about a work of fiction with the power to reshape the fabric of reality is sort of inherently up itself, and that's before we get to the fact that Sam Lake, the director and writer of the game, casts himself in it as three different characters, which takes us so up ourselves we can start speedbagging our own uvula. Not three different characters, Yards, they're arguably three different aspects of the same character. Uh huh. Well, that's just slid us another six or seven inches up ourselves, hasn't it? Now our hands are sticking out of our mouth and gesturing to see the wine list, and the combat reaches all new original levels of being kinda shit, and once again feels like it was tokenly included to retain the title of video game in the traditional sense, the equivalent of the one cafe latte the pretentious screenwriter buys every couple of hours so he can keep using his laptop in the Starbucks. But first, the plot summary. Horror writer Alan Wake jumped into a big lake full of mysterious occult wank to save his wife and is now trying to escape from the mysterious occult wank by writing a story that the mysterious occult wank will turn into reality somehow, and there's an FBI agent in the real world who becomes aware of getting pulled into the reality Alan Wake is creating, and there's an evil version of Alan Wake who looks just like him but less soberly dressed, and everyone and all of reality might be real or fictional, but it doesn't really matter. Oh, and the first game and the DLC for Control are both canon and essential reading for understanding what the fuck's going on, but the semi-sequel Alan Wake American Nightmare you should completely disregard. Any questions? No? Good, moving on. Gameplay is split between two parallel storylines, classic Resident Evil style, although you can switch back and forth between chapters, and I do recommend alternating because the story about Saga Anderson, the nice confused FBI agent and normal person, getting her head around all this pretentious bollocks makes for a nice break from the Alan Wake sections, where he continues wandering uselessly around his personal nightmare realm, while being so up himself he's considering the real estate potential of his lower duodenum. Also, the unique features of Story Saga, I mean of Saga's story, include a detective adventure game element, where we apply the known facts to the appropriate bits of red string on our giant mental cork board to unlock the next lead. Not that there's much actual deduction involved, it's fairly easily brute forced by just throwing every fact to every thread until something clicks, which is certainly easier than deducing which of the three threads that a fact could potentially go on to was the one the developers were actually thinking of. Nevertheless, I found myself missing it during Alan's chapters because at least it obliged me to demonstrate some understanding of what the fuck was going on to proceed, whereas, and let's be fair here, Alan's bits have clearly prioritised atmosphere over narrative coherence, and now let's be less fair, it's a bedraggled dude wandering around a load of old bollocks with a look on his face like he's expecting a worm from a giant mummy bird. Alan's game takes a more silent hilly approach where we systematically explore an abandoned hotel or dog grooming salon, looking for the locked doors and the keys to open the locked doors like a janitor on his first day whose supervisor isn't answering their phone, with the added twist of Alan's power to rewrite the story to alter certain rooms and open up new doorways. It gives a rather effectively creepy feel of being trapped in a surreal introspective world with a sense of reality as reliable and permanent as a career in corporate tech journalism, but then one of the wibbly wobbly shadow dudes elbows you in the face and you remember you're also trapped in a surreal introspective world with a shitty combat system. How do I hate thee, let me count the ways. You have to stun enemies with your flashlight before you can even hurt them, so if you're out of flashlight battery, all you can do is mug to camera and tug on your collar meaningfully. And only some of the shadow enemies in Alan's world are actually a threat. You waste flashlight on some of them and they just disappear, going, sorry I was just looking for the bog. Meanwhile, Saga's combat usually happens in the middle of thick wilderness and features a lot of enemies getting right up in her face, and the camera placement means the subsequent experience consists of staring at a few really close up leaves while listening to sounds that may or may not represent Saga getting the absolute jurisdiction beaten out of her. There's a dodge move, but it more resembles the character being briefly seized by the urge to breakdance and flips a coin on whether or not it actually bloody dodges anything. Still, combat being shitty and generally to be avoided is often the point in a horror game, you're not supposed to feel like Chuck fucking Norris, roundhouse kicking the little girl from the ring back down the well, but still, there's scary shitty combat and there's annoying shitty combat. It's the difference between Michael Myers chasing you through the dark spooky house and Michael Myers preventing you from pulling out of the dark spooky house because he parked his car across the driveway. I've got other gripes. The storytelling is still mired in that remedy habit of going, we're playing things out in exactly the manner we want and if you've got ideas of 
of your own for where to stand during this unskippable conversation, then you can jolly well put them up yourself, Sunny Jim. And the ending sucks. I won't spoil anything, but if you're wondering why Alan Wake American Nightmare is no longer canon, it's because it had a satisfying ending that tied up all the loose ends that might have kept the DLC and sequel trainer rolling indefinitely, and you can be fucking well certain Alan Wake 2 is determined not to repeat that mistake. But at the end of the day, Alan Wake 2 has an undeniable energy and division that it is clearly unwilling to compromise, and that alone makes it worth checking out. There are certainly moments that may provoke an eye roll or two, but there's nothing inherently wrong with being up yourself. It's just another word for auteur, isn't it? And it's a good way to check for prostate cancer. But you know, talking about prostate cancer makes me think about how ephemeral life is, and how transitory the things we take for granted can be. Look at me. Two weeks ago I was making a series called Zero Punctuation for a site called The Escapist, and that's all changed now. We've moved on to Second Wind, where we can be 100% creator-owned and independently funded. There's all kinds of country we can get away with now. But there's one benefit to corporate ownership, and that's that you always knew where your paycheck was coming from, and so if you enjoy our content and believe in what we're trying to build here, all I ask is that you consider donating as little as a dollar a month to our Patreon, linked below. There's all kinds of crazy perks and behind-the-scenes access you could be enjoying, and if you can't spare a thing, that's fine, even a like and a subscribe could go a long way, or perhaps sending the video link to some of your millionaire friends. Thanks for listening, and an extra special thanks to everyone who's already done their bit to support us. The response since it all went down really has been extremely humbling. Don't worry, I'm not going to have an impassioned talk like this every week. I think next time we'll go back to the smash cutting to the overly loud credits music right after the final gag. It's just because this is the first. Don't want anyone to think I'm getting sincere all of a sudden. And furthermore, bum balls, wankety wank, labia flatulent gush. <laughs>